Diabetes Connections is brought to you by OneDrop, created for people with diabetes by people who have diabetes, by Real Good Foods, real food you feel good about eating, and by Dexcom. Take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, making CGM available to hospitals, something new because of the healthcare crisis caused by COVID-19. We talked to Dexcom CEO about training and more. We don't want to just drop sensors on a hospital and say, use these. Because if we do, what we're going to get is a bad outcome. We have an opportunity to make this work and to make this great for patients going forward. Kevin Sayer explains how the program came about. They needed FDA permission, why it's needed, and how he hopes it'll help. We also talk about other Dexcom news, financial issues, and the discontinuation of G4 and G5 as they move ahead with G7. In Tell Me Something Good, taking flight finally, and a birthday, a diversary, and a family of healthcare heroes. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. Welcome to another week of the show. I am so glad to have you along. I'm your host, Stacey Sims. And before we get started, I just want to say it's been absolutely incredible to connect with so many of you in a different way these last couple of weeks. I've had some Zoom calls where we've we've jumped on. We've just talked really about nothing. I mean, I haven't had much of an agenda other than saying hi and getting to know people. There's been more engagement in the Facebook group. We've done some polls. I've emailed and direct messaged more than ever. So the podcast industry is interesting because right now, if you're looking at that, I don't know why you would, listenership is down because people aren't commuting. They're not in their cars as much. We're not alone as much. And I don't know about you, but I usually listen to podcasts by myself. But I feel like more than ever, I'm excited to be doing this show because I feel like I'm, I'm really getting to know the people listening. And I'll be honest with you, I've needed those conversations. I've needed those messages. It's hard to keep going at times like this, right? We're all lonely. We're all isolated. Even if you're so lucky like I am to be lonely and isolated with your family and you get along with your family. <laughs> I mean, most of the time, let's not get crazy. But I'm so lucky, and even I find I'm really needing that outside connection. So thank you all for being there. If you haven't had a chance to jump on, I do almost all of this in the Facebook group. It's the easiest place. I find it's where people uh, notice it the most. You know, the Facebook page is great, but you know how Facebook works. Nobody sees that unless you pay for it. So jump into the Facebook group, Diabetes Connections, the group, and maybe we can meet and we can chat online. We're going to get to Dexcom in just a moment. Want to give you a quick update, as you have likely heard by now, Novo Nordisk has followed Lilly, although they probably wouldn't phrase it like that, in lowering the price of insulin with the backdrop of COVID-19. I am going to link up again the Lilly program, which is $35, unless you have government insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, a lot of state programs are excluded. But if you have commercial insurance or no insurance, you likely qualify for this. So I'll put that information out. Novo Nordisk, which already had a $99 program that did not depend on your insurance as far as I know. Again, please look these up. There's so much information here. They now have made available a free for 90 day, a no cost for 90 day insulin program for people who have lost their jobs. So that's again, even if you have COBRA in the United States, I know if you're outside of the United States, a lot of this does not apply to you. Lucky you. But if you need these programs, please Check out the episode homepage at diabetes-connections.com or just Google them up. It's Novo Nordisk, Eli Lilly, Lilly Diabetes. Um, we're going to probably hear from Sanofi in the days to come, and there will be more and more programs. We do get into that with Dexcom. I don't have anything to announce, or I would have led with that. I'm not burying the lead here, but I did ask Kevin Sayer about what is Dexcom doing to help people who are out of work and who cannot afford the products that they have used for so many years. So you'll be hearing that during the interview. I also, and I do this every time, I'm sorry if you're a longtime listener, I know you get tired of hearing it, but it's important. I also need to point out that, as you've heard, Dexcom is a sponsor of this show, and they have been for several years now, I believe since our second year, and I appreciate that very much. Our agreement means I talk about them in a commercial, which you will hear later in the show, but it doesn't mean that I don't get to ask hard questions. So I very much appreciate them understanding that. We are 
big fans of Dexcom. I mean, I don't have to do the commercial now, but if you've listed, you know, we've used them for six and a half years. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan. It works beautifully for Benny. But I have to serve you as my listener first. If I'm not doing that, then there is no show. So ethically, I always like to disclose when I talk to a sponsor that I am talking to a sponsor. And speaking of sponsors, it is time for me to tell you about another one of our sponsors. We will get to the interview in just a moment. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Real Good Foods. Real Good Foods has been a sponsor of our Tell Me Something Good segment. I've changed that segment now every Monday when I post on social media to be healthcare heroes in the diabetes community. And Real Good Foods, thank you so much. They've supported me in that as well. And I got to tell you, we are loving the ice cream. We sampled that almost a month ago now. And I absolutely love the peanut butter chocolate chip and the mint chocolate chip ice cream. They are so good. I have not, I think the only flavor I haven't had yet is the salted caramel. Not a big caramel fan. Um, Although I think others in my house would devour that. But I love chocolate and I love peanut butter. So that is the way to go for me. Of course, if you want real real food, no pun intended there. If you want real food, they have pizzas, they have enchiladas, they have really just a nice variety of food. It's super easy to order. I mean, I talk about being in the grocery store freezer, but if you're not going to the grocery store right now, just go to their website and you can order it. They have they have flash sales all the time right now. Make sure to check those out because stuff will go on sale for a couple of days or even just you know 48 hours. Always go and check that out. You can get some really great deals and have it sent right to you. Very easy. Just go to diabetes-connections.com. Click on the Real Good Foods logo. A couple of days ago, we got the news that Dexcom and Abbott, which makes the Libre, were going to start making their sensors, their systems, available to hospitals. Maybe I'll look foolish here, but I did not know this. I did not realize that there was a separate FDA process for getting permission to use these systems in a hospital setting. I assumed it was more a question of training and cost and and just acceptance. But it turns out you do need FDA permission to use these continuous glucose monitoring systems in hospital settings. I'll link up on the episode homepage just what Abbott is doing, because obviously I'm not talking to them here. But they are making their system. They are donating 25,000 Freestyle Libre 14-day sensors in partnership with the American Diabetes Association, Insulin for Life USA, and the Diabetes Disaster Response Coalition. Dexcom says it is committed to making and producing 100,000 sensors for hospitalized coronavirus patients. They're donating 10,000 phones and receivers, and you will hear more about that from Kevin in just a moment. I have some questions, and you may too, after this interview, that I think can only be answered by healthcare workers in hospital or healthcare workers who have hospital experience. So if that's you, I'd urge you to listen to this interview and then get in touch with me. Because my my real question, I can't ask the CEO of Dexcom this question, not because it's out of place, but because I don't think he, he knows. How could he know? I'm curious how this is actually going to work in a hospital setting. Like, what, what is it really going to look like? I mean, most of us who listen to this podcast understand how the Libre and how the Dexcom works. But I'm really curious what it will look like in a hospital setting when it's not the patient or the patient's parents looking at the receiver, looking at the phone, that sort of thing. But that's a different issue than making them available in the first place. So here is my interview with Dexcom CEO, Kevin Sayer. Kevin, let me, let me start by asking, how are you doing? Everybody staying safe and staying home as much as possible? I am staying home and staying safe as much as possible. I, since the office is deserted, quite frankly, it's almost safer than home. In some respects, because there's no one in the neighborhood, so we I, I've just been going in maybe once once a week for a little while to take a couple of calls and then working from home. I have learned I have learned a lot of things about work at home tools that I that I need, like I needed a better camera on my computer and some better. It's interesting as you go through this and realize just little things. Our company, uh, so me personally, my kids are all great, so that's good. Our company, Stacy, we have done absolutely everything we possibly can to take care of our people and our employees. We, you know, mid-March when we sent everybody home, uh, we were definitely the first in our area, one of the first in our area. I think Illumina might have been a little bit ahead of us, but we were very quick there and we have work from home tools that we put in place. Our IT team has just been tireless in getting people 
the type of connectivity and, and voice services and stuff they need from home. That's been great. We've had to keep the manufacturing plants open, obviously, because patients need product. Uh, in light of that, in light of the fact that we are taking a group and making them come to work, uh, we've provided them with economic uh, benefits to whereby we can compensate for the fact, for example, that they are leaving their kids or home from school home, whereas you don't have the summer daycare plan or the camps you could put them in. So we've compensated our people a bit more to make sure they can take care of their families. We've reorganized the place in manufacturing with respect to small pods of people working together. So if someone went, might get exposed, we don't wipe out a manufacturing floor of 800 people, just a few. And we're making them take breaks in groups. We're making them take, it, literally, it, we've got thermal scanners. We've, we, we've got uh, time between shifts. So we're not at full capacity, but we're close. So I, I think our company has been as absolutely as responsible as we possibly can through this to our people. And we said that in the beginning that, that our, you know, our first goal is our, our employees. Our second priority is going to be making sure is our patients to make sure that they have product. And our third goal is the community and making sure we're good citizens in the community and do our part. And I think our, our hospital efforts fall into both two and three, diabetes patients, but also this community in general, because when we think of the risks our, our healthcare providers are, are going through to fight this. My second son, he, he's 36 now, so obviously this back many years, but when he was 10, he had bone cancer and he went to a camp called Dream Street, a kid's camp, kind of like the diabetes camps, but it was really just a lot of fun. And one of his counselors there was a young man trying to be a stand-up comic who abandoned comedy to become an, an ER doc in New York City. And our family gets text messages from him on a, on a daily basis just He's giving us a diary, and when you read that, it's like, oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh, wow. uh, and that, that's what we need to do to help the community is, is is ease burdens for guys like him. Let's talk about the hospital program then. So tell me what Dexcom is doing. The the release says shipping continuous glucose monitoring systems directly to hospitals in need. What is the thinking here? Well, let me take you back a little bit. When this all started. More than a month ago, when things started getting very bit, bit here in the U.S. and even before that in Europe, it became very clear that people with diabetes are more at risk if they get contract COVID than those without diabetes. Statistics are pretty staggering. I mean, it's it, it's plain black and white here. And we had heard from hospitals in Europe and back east uh, as this thing started to grow, they wanted to use our system in the hospital where we are not approved for use yet. Our system has been used in, in the hospital in some IRB-approved studies uh, in the past because we were preparing for that day and trying to develop a body of evidence that would support this. Uh, but, it, you know, it, it early phases by us and early discussions with the FDA because before we roll on full-on commercial into the hospital, we need to understand all the things about how our Bluetooth interacts with all the other communication protocols in hospital rooms, what it's going to talk to, where it's going to be displayed, and also make sure that the actual sensor from a chemistry perspective functions the way it's labeled on people in a hospital who are on multiple compounds versus those of us who are at home in other routines who are on the compounds we're used to. And so we've done some work on that, but once it started heating up, particularly in centers where an endocrinologist who knew of Dexcom got involved, it quickly became, we want this and we want it now. We didn't have FDA approval there, so we started speaking with the FDA we did get a, an emergency provision that, all right, go ahead, ship to hospitals. And we've looked at this, and we've taken a lot of time on this, Stacey. Um, we got 100 FTEs working on this hospital thing full time. Uh, we put that many of our people into this to make sure that this works. Um, we needed to build a, a, a pricing structure for how they could buy it. We are charging the hospitals less than the commercial patients as part of our, our contribution to the community. Uh, we know that the sensor, the transmitter has to talk to something, either a Dexcom receiver or a phone. The phone's a better option. So we are giving the hospitals phones and or receivers for the beds to manage the patients. Uh, we've developed separate training materials for the hospital, devoted our entire education team pretty much to them full time right now as they're training uh, the hospitals to get up on the system. We have developed um, a, a surveillance team, literally, to uh, take calls to if we hear anything going on with sensors uh, to investigate and make sure we understand so that there's not something that we would have missed. We have devoted a lot of time and effort to this as a company. We want to make sure it works. We want to make sure if we're going to go there, we are going to help people. The most appealing thing about Dexcom in the hospital 
over anybody else in the space, there's a couple. You know, the first one is the connectivity. By connecting to a phone, theoretically, if the phone can be outside the, the room where a patient is, or even if it just hangs from the bed, uh, from the from the pole at the bed, but it's a phone and you can use follow on an iPad out in the hall, you're able to monitor patients remotely. You know, I've been in ICUs around the country as we study this market, and I've seen ICUs where the protocol is a finger stick every 30 minutes, 48 finger sticks a day. Don't think nurses are following that protocol right now. They're too busy. So to the extent we can make that labor much more efficient, and if we can take, and, and the problem in the hospital is not uh, hypoglycemia as it is for the patients in the field so much, it's hyperglycemia. Um, not only are they getting too high because they don't want to be too aggressive on a drip insulin, if they're not going to be sticking the finger every half hour, they don't have a CGM, so they're monitoring less aggressively. On top of that, the steroid treatment and some of the other treatments for the respiratory ailments can go- cause glucose to rise much faster than it would if you weren't in that environment. So what we were seeing is patients going DKA and fighting DKA at the same time they're fighting to breathe. And that's what the physicians and, and the hospitals were seeing. So we have developed a plan and a protocol uh, as to shipping product to the hospital, supporting the hospitals, educating the hospitals, training the hospitals, giving them a place to call, learning as we go. Because the other thing, remember, most of the doctors here are not people who are used to CGM every day. Right. They're ER docs. That's the question I, I wanted to ask is, can you tell us a little bit more about the training? You said you had people who developed this. I, you know, I'm a huge fan of CGM. We've, unfortunately, we've had to take Benny to the hospital, not diabetes related, but having the CGM was fantastic. It helped so much, but we brought it in, you know, they didn't provide it. But how is an ER doctor, how is a nurse in an ICU going to take the time to be trained? Can you share any of kind of the process here? Right back to Kevin answering that question in just a moment. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by OneDrop. OneDrop is diabetes management for the 21st century. OneDrop was designed by people with diabetes for people with diabetes. OneDrop's glucose meter looks nothing like a medical device. It's sleek, compact, and seamlessly integrates with the award-winning OneDrop mobile app. Sync all your other health apps to OneDrop to keep track of the big picture and easily see health trends. And with a OneDrop subscription, you get unlimited test strips and lancets delivered directly to your door. Every OneDrop plan also includes access to your own certified diabetes coach. Have questions but don't feel like waiting until your next doctor's visit? Your personal coach is always there to help. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the OneDrop logo to learn more. Now back to Dexcom's Kevin Sayer, and he's answering my question about training hospital staff. We started with a 108-slide user guide and realized that was never going to work. (laughs) 108 slides like a PowerPoint? 108 slides because that's what you do. You become FDA compliant and you do a fall-on user guide and try and walk them through every page. And after one training session, we said, yeah, that's not going to work. And so we've condensed it. We have a two-page quick starter. And then we have, I don't know, just a several-page other user guide. And then we have people available by the phones if they need to. So far, the, and then what we're providing is video training, uh, and we find we can get those trainings done in just under an hour. Uh, and then they, what, what, what really is happening, I would tell you we're in the early phases of this. Hospitals are phasing it. They're putting it on a few patients and watching, seeing what they learn, seeing what the outcome is. And then after they do that, then they'll roll it out bigger. Our constraining item so far has been getting phones. We've had to go procure the phones ourselves. We've had to buy them from the usual sources uh, and pay cash. Uh, to get them. So we're getting the phones. We're pre-configuring the phones. We've got another entity involved who's literally pre-programming the phones whereby the only app running on the phone is going to be the Dexcom G6 app. Uh, so a- a- again, we are learning what physicians aren't going to want to do. You talk about training. We don't want to have to train them to program phones. It's easier if we have somebody else program the phones and we're funding that effort as well. Um but every day you come across a new barrier and a new hurdle to jump over to make this work everywhere. Some of the stories we've gotten so far, uh, anecdotally, have been extremely positive. Um, the, uh, but, but, but I can tell you the, the hiccup today that I heard from one facility is we got, we got phones shipped to this hospital, one of the first ones to get phones, and their ID department won't let them use them on the wireless network. 
because they haven't been tested to meet hospital security. And, and so you think you know everything about the hospital environment. And Stacy, that's why we have been so deliberate and thoughtful and methodical as we do this. We don't want to just drop sensors on a hospital and say, use these. Because if we do, what we're going to get is a bad outcome. We, need, we, we have an opportunity to make this work and to make this great for patients going forward. So we are really heavily invested in making sure we do this the right way. And, and, and so, yeah, we train them. We get calls back. In the cases, in, in, in several of the hotspot hospitals, we're dealing directly with an endocrinologist who's training patients because there's so much diabetes in the hospital that the uh, endocrinologists have literally got involved in the training. Uh, and, and, and so that's been good, but it has been, uh, it's just been crazy. And, and we, we have, we very much appreciate the FDA's willingness to let us go here. We are going to gather all this data when we're done. We're going to gather every bit of data that we can gather and use this as real world, world evidence and then go back to the agency and say, look, here's what we've learned about use of the product in the hospital. What do we do next? Because I think that is a, a great use for this product. You had mentioned that you're going to be giving the phones and possibly the receivers to the hospitals and selling the sensors, and I, I believe the transmitter, correct me if I'm wrong, at a discounted price. Do you know what happens to the patient? Because I would be very concerned having, you know, the most, the notorious, you get an aspirin in the hospital and it costs you $800. You know, if I come in with my own Dexcom sensor, it's one thing, but if a hospital puts one on me, is there a guarantee here that the patients that are using this discounted system are not going to be charged full price or even more on the other side? These people are so sick, that's the least of my concerns. I think, I, I guess I would hate that. This is not being used to keep somebody safe at school. This is being used to save somebody's life. And if our data can, can make somebody healthier and better, one of the initial stories I heard, for example, young woman comes into the hospital, type one, she's in total renal failure. Things look bad. They're going to put on our ventilator. They said, wait a minute. She's DK. Let's put her on a CGM first. Four hours later, her glucose levels are back down in the 100 to 150 range. And not only did she feel well enough to be conscious, but they didn't even put her on a ventilator and she got well. What's that worth? Well, Kevin, then let me ask you this. Why not then give the sensors free and clear to the hospital so that they won't? I mean, I guess the question is. I will tell you, I will go through that as well. First of all, they don't have devices to receive the data with. Second of all, we've been very thoughtful and planned this as much as we can, because I don't want to be the person who tells all the parents of children that you don't have sensors anymore. So when we started this process, we have three groups we're considering, our employees, our patients, and our community. We are going to make sure our patients who have CGM in the field still have CGM. And, and, and we will do that. We are charging the hospital some. We're giving away the phones and the receivers. This is not a money-making endeavor for us, given the amount of people we have working on it. We're, we're going to get enough to cover what we put into it at, at best when all is said and done. Uh, the reason we're charging and we're limiting demand is because the last thing we could afford would be for our patient community to have every patient in the hospital walk in on Mac Life CGM slapped on them. Can't do that. We don't have the capacity for that. We have the capacity... We're very familiar with the number of, we've built models, Stacy, based on the number of ICU beds, based on the projected number of cases, based on peaks by state, based on everything you could think of, the percentage of the patients that have diabetes, the percentage that don't. We have a sensor forecast. We said in our initial news release, we've allocated up to 100,000 sensors, and that also means 50,000 transmitters to this. And if the need comes for more, we'll certainly evaluate it. Uh, but those allocations are based on what we could see being used in ICU beds and, and the demand. We believe we'll have enough and we'll make enough available to hit the demand from the hospitals and supply everything to all of our patients. Kevin, my question was not about Dexcom making money. The question was about the hospitals charging patients and the unintended consequences they won't. of that. And it, they won't. I, if they do, like I said, if they do. I, I can't control what the hospital does, but but if you look at a hospital, I, and I've, I've had discussions here, Stacey, and it's, you know, as we go through this crisis and we look at this as a country and as an economy, now I'm getting way off base. I apologize. Go off base. We love that. It's fascinating to me how the ramifications are going to reverberate through the community. Elective procedures in hospitals are not being done. So, because nobody's going in, 
if you can get that knee replaced in two months, you're probably not going in today. And and so you have you have an economy that's going to be affected long term by all this. I have no idea what hospitals will charge for these sensors. They'll bill what what they'll bill. We have made it as as affordable as possible. And if we can get all these logistics worked out and the connectivity and all the other issues, we think it's just going to be a win for them all uh, going forward. We're also relatively convinced based on the data that we have seen. And I, again, you go to the University of Washington, John Hopkins, we've mapped out the peaks in all the states, how many people they think will be in hospitals. And we're very comfortable we can serve that with what we have. And then we'll, we'll go from there. Um, jumping off the, the point of how things are going to change, and as I know you saw, obviously, the whole diabetes community is following Lily's move to cut insulin to $35 with restrictions. I got a lot of questions from listeners when I mentioned we were talking today about whether Dexcom had any plans for financial assistance programs for people who have lost their jobs and thus lost their insurance. We're studying that right now and putting together, uh, they're putting together several alternatives for me. We are studying that. I won't commit to anything, but it's an absolutely initiative that we are undertaking and looking at uh, because this does has become that important to our patients. So we're trying to figure out how that works. And I've had calls with uh, numerous other companies in the industry to discuss what they're planning and what they're doing, uh, just so I can get a grasp of, as to how that works. But we we're working on something. I don't have anything to announce, and it may be a while. We'll see. But but we are considering it absolutely. As the as you said, as the landscape changes, you know, we're not quite sure what insurance will look like and what employment will look like for so many people who have been on the you know Dexcom customers for a while. Oh yeah. Um, I know we're going to run out of time. Go ahead. No, I I agree with you 100. percent There are people now, Stacy, who have no idea how to manage their glucose without a CGM because they didn't even learn on finger sticks. These new patients have learned on Dexcom from the beginning. If we have learned one thing through this process in the diabetes community, and and we do hold it very reverently, how important this technology has become in people's lives. And it's not just the patients. We are getting every day testimonials from doctors saying the only patients I can care for are my Dexcomers because I have their data and clarity. And I've got this remote monitoring capability with my Dexcom patients I don't have with the others. This is awesome. Clarity's uh, making some changes this week. Could be. I got an email about that. Yep. I was just curious why, why or if there's anything you want to say about that while we're talking. I don't think they're major or going to change the whole system. Okay. We continually try and improve that. And then another question I'd like to ask is that this month Dexcom announced that in June it'll discontinue G4 Platinum and G5 transmitter sales. Can you talk about that? Uh, you had mentioned that at one point this would be happening, but can you talk about that? And then I'll also ask uh, same question. This on the front end, G7, where we stand with that? You know, I'll start with the easier one. G7, we're working through. Obviously, with what's gone on, clinical trials have slowed down significantly. Our ability to purchase equipment on the we, we, while we've purchased a lot of manufacturing equipment, our ability to set it up and get it in has been affected by all this. Um, we'll give more color on the earnings call uh, about that. We're still extremely bullish on it, and we will do everything we can to accelerate those timeframes. We really haven't taken a full inventory of where everything is. We'll talk about that more in a couple of weeks, but there certainly are, are environmental factors that, that will have an effect on it. Right, right now, what my team is doing is looking at the mitigation possibilities for any of this stuff, and, and I don't have anything in front of me, but it is front and center, our thoughts. With respect to G4 and G5, from a manufacturing and a cost perspective, it's costing us a tremendous amount of money to keep those lines running. We need the space for G6 and G7. In addition to that, by supporting G4 and G5, we're supporting, they gave me a list of how many Dexcom software apps we were supporting the other day. And I went, yeah, it's time. We believe G6 is the right product for our patients. We believe when they use it, they will find that it is. I know why people don't want G5 and G4 shut down, discontinued. It always relates to extending the life of the sensor, and I get it. Um, I'm hopeful that over time we can make it easier for patients to get. And, and a better commercial structure to whereby it's not as important economically as it was before as we continue to drive for more pharmacy coverage, which typically results in lower co-pays for our patients. But operationally, it just doesn't make sense for us to continue to, to build those things. And we shut the transmitters off first because we know people will still have sensors. If they have a transmitter that works, they will still want some sensors. Uh, but there's a, day, a shutoff day for sensors coming not long after that, and we'll be G6 driven and then be getting all our G7 lines up and running and 
this is in you know this is in in conjunction with the plans we had at the beginning of the year so this is not a a date that we've moved up or moved back this is exactly what we were planning on right and you have mentioned that here before as well Kevin, before I let you go, I do have to ask, I feel a responsibility as a person with access to you. And again, I appreciate how accessible you are. You always come on and answer these questions. It's not always sunshine and roses, and I do appreciate that. But I feel obligated to just ask you one more time, or at least put this out there. This is really an unprecedented time. And I'm so appreciative of what Dexcom is doing, getting into the hospitals, you know, making things more affordable that way, donating what you are donating putting all these people to work to get this stuff done. But as you consider pricing and help for people who have lost jobs and lost insurance, please keep in mind the diabetes community that has helped Dexcom get to a point where you're about to join the NASDAQ 100. I know. With a successful product. Yeah. I mean, it's exciting times, but it's also it's not, listen. a time of worry for so many people. Our culture from the beginning has been, if you take care of the patient's things will eventually work out. We will absolutely consider this and do everything uh, reasonably possible while maintaining, obviously, our position as a public company and taking care of our shareholders as well. There are a number of things going on internally that we really haven't talked about. As we increase capacity, as we phase down G4 and G5, quite frankly, and can devote that space to G6 and G7, that might give us more flexibility with respect to to our inventory. Because one of our calls last year, Stacey, was we explained to you why we had 10 day waits before we could ship and we don't want to go right, through, we, right. we don't want to go through that again so we are absolutely looking at all these things all the logistics involved all involved everything involved all over the world as well and that's another thing uh, you know one of the things that used to be much more simple about Dexcom we were so US focused that we just did whatever we wanted to in the US and now our worldwide base is getting very large so we we're making worldwide decisions too which is uh it's really cool, but it's also complex. Everything needs to be everything needs to be considered. We'll be we're cognizant of that. We will think of it. Uh, we will develop what we hope will be a good plan. Yeah, because you know the fear is that if you can sell to hospitals, you don't really have to worry so much about individuals, and then that's very difficult to, to for people. To well, do. and as I said in the beginning, that's why we've taken this hospital approach very measured and very thoughtful, and and made sure that we have enough capacity to take care of our Dexcomers who depend on this each and every day. We have to. And fortunately, as we've spoke with many of the hospitals, when they get an endocrinologist involved, they very much know that we have to take care of the diabetes patients first and foremost. So that has been uh, that has been easy to explain so far. Kevin, I forgot to ask you one. I have to ask you one technical question that I did not ask earlier. I'm sorry about the hospitalizations. So much of the COVID reporting has been that it's devastating for people with type 2 diabetes. Obviously, we were talking about people with all types of diabetes. But are are you finding that are, are these Dexcoms going to the hospitals? Are all of these people using insulin? Is this for all people with type 2 who use insulin? Is it just for type 2? Are you just leaving that up to the hospitals? Because it, it just seems to me that putting a Dexcom on a type 2 who doesn't use insulin I don't understand, and I'm not an endocrinologist. I'll be able to explain it to you. What is happening with these type 2 patients when they go in is their glucose is spiraling out of control every bit as much as an insulin user. It appears that the effect of the virus and the treatments related to the virus are causing glucose challenges in these people far beyond what one would have anticipated. We're very early in our hospital phases. I believe, haven't talked to all of them, but I believe that they're starting with the insulin-using patients. But in all candor, a lot of these type 2 patients are being put on insulin, IV insulin as well, to get their, their glucose levels under control. So it's being used across everybody. I think I need to give the FDA a kudo, a kudo here because they gave us permission to treat anyone, not just people with diabetes. That's a huge step uh, for us. If somebody's glucose compromised uh, during this time in the hospital, if we can bring their glucose back under control, that, that, that's a big win. And, and we are reading uh, a lot about about type 2s who have glucose levels that are just going nuts. Actually, I'm hearing about people who don't even know they have diabetes whose glucose levels are behaving like that. So it's, uh, look, this is, it's unprecedented times on a number of fronts. And, and we're still here. We are absolutely working on things and, and, and considering things for our patients first. But we see an opportunity, whereas if this thing works and we can, can save some lives and make health caregivers' jobs better, 
and make them able to treat this better, we're going to we're going to do this and we're going to do it right while balancing the two. We're never going to ignore our patients, Stacy. That, that that's just not how we're wired. Well, I really appreciate you spending time with me, Kevin, to talk about it and explain the system. And we will look forward to seeing how it works out. You know, we'll follow up. So thanks for being here today. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for taking the time to, to chat with me, really. In spite of the airplane zooming over my head, I it's always <laughs> fun to talk with you. And and again, kudos to, to all those on the front lines doing this, but kudos to, to our team. These people, I mean, it's been 24-7 for about a week and a half. They're, they're tired. So... Uh, yeah. Getting this this thing rolled out has just been, it, it's what we're best at. We are really good at figuring these things out. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacy Sims. More information about Dexcom and Abbott's hospital program, just go to diabetes-connections.com and you can see the episode homepage. There's also a transcript of our interview there. I should also mention, I asked about clarity because maybe by the time this episode is out, that news has come out as well. But I got an email, not as a media person, but as a user of the Dexcom system, that clarity was going to have an update and a different look. Maybe it's not that dramatic, but if there is information on that, I will link that up as well. I did ask Kevin after the interview if perhaps in a few months when things calm down, hopefully they will calm down, we could revisit this with a doctor, an ICU nurse, with somebody in a hospital patient who used it and benefited from this program, because I'm really curious how it works and how it worked and how it helped. So we'll hopefully be able to revisit that down the road. I'm really curious about it. And of course, it does sound like there is something in the works in terms of financial help coming from Dexcom. It sounds like they're taking a hard look at that. So I will circle back around with them and see what they had in mind. As I said at the beginning of the show, Dexcom is a sponsor of Diabetes Connections and has been for a few years. So here is the separating line from the interview and my comments to the commercial. But I, it's kind of hard to separate sometimes because we really do like the system that much. But Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. And it really is hard to think of something that has changed our diabetes management as much as the Dexcom share and follow apps. It really has helped us talk less about diabetes. It's wonderful with share and follow because as a caregiver, a parent, a spouse, or whatever, you can help the person with diabetes manage in the way that works for your individual situation. And when Benny was nine, that's a lot different than when Benny is 15 and doesn't need me breathing down his neck. <laughs> I can just look at the Dexcom and he and I can talk about parameters and we can use it to have really great conversations. And we can also have fewer conversations about diabetes. Internet connectivity is required to access Dexcom Follow. Separate follow app required. Learn more. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. Time for Tell Me Something Good. And oh my goodness, this is a great one. We told you, I want to say late last year, that in America, the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, changed the policy and that people with type 1 diabetes, people actually who use insulin, that was the disqualifier earlier, it wasn't so much the diabetes, but that people who used insulin could obtain a first class medical certificate, which is the certification that pilots need in order to fly for a commercial airline here in the States. Well, that happened late last year. And it seemed like, you know, I don't know, things were happening locally. We have a pilot that was felt like things were being held up and we'd had some other people in the Facebook group saying, when is this going to happen? Well, lo and behold, this week, Pietro Marsala has become the very first insulin treated pilot to be certified by the FAA for first class medical. He was diagnosed with type one diabetes eight years ago at the age of 21. It has always been his dream to fly and now he's going to be able to do it. So Pietro, I am going to reach out to you. You know, we're going to track him down and try to do an interview, but how fabulous is that? And you can follow him on Instagram. I'll link that up because he has posted his certificate. He put out, he X out all the information that, you know, could track him down, but wow, that's just absolutely fantastic. Congratulations to you and to so many people who want to fly. Another tell me something good, a lot to celebrate in this family 
Rohan recently marked his second anniversary. He was diagnosed at the age of two. He is now about four years old. I posted a picture of him and his mom and dad on social media earlier this week. He is so cute. He likes Paw Patrol and he loves Taekwondo. And man, he's just really an exuberant kid. I was very lucky enough to meet him and his mom at a Friends for Life conference. It was probably just last year. So Rohan marked his second anniversary. His mother, Margarita, celebrated her birthday this week. She is a nurse. And in one of those really wild diabetes coincidences, I'm pretty sure that she spoke to my aunt's group. My aunt runs a group for families in the Tampa, Florida area. And I think Margarita did speak to that group. So we'll find out on that one, but that's pretty funny. As I said, she's a nurse and her husband is a hospitalist. Her husband, Shreyas, is a hospitalist and has to go to work every day. He is essential personnel. So she says that she's okay, you know, trying to take some deep breaths. And uh, she says we make sure to clean everything after he comes home. You know, when things do calm down, I would really love to talk to some of these families. I can't imagine what they're going through. Just the fear, right? The pride that you have in, in your husband or your wife going out to help so many people who desperately need it. But that fear... Um, when they come home for their health, for your health, for your child. Thank you so much for sharing your adorable pictures. And we will continue to tell these stories. If you have Tell Me Something Good, it can be something that you think is small, a huge milestone. Definitely share those healthcare hero stories. I'd love to hear them. I'd love to tell them. So thank you so much. So this is the part of the show where I used to say, hey, this is where I'm going. This is where I'll be. I hope to meet you here. And gosh, March and April, I don't know about you, I was booked. I had so many trips. I have so many airline miles and credits now (laughs) that hopefully I'll be able to use. And I mean, I'm laughing. I know many people have more serious issues and, uh, you know, I I don't want to make light of the situation, but man, it, it was really disappointing. I love traveling. I love meeting people at conferences. I love talking about the issues that I feel are important, but hey. I am going to have a virtual meetup. I'm actually, um, I've got one for sure, and I'm working on a second. So watch this space. But um, this is besides the Zoom hangouts that I've been putting together. So hang out in the Facebook group for those as well. The one that is for sure is next Wednesday, the 22nd. JDRF, uh, the Michigan, the Detroit chapter, they have a huge conference every year. I was set to go and speak there. And um, they have moved it online. So that is going to be digital. I don't know if it's open to all, but I will be posting about it. I have a meeting with them this week. So as soon as I know what's going on, I'll be posting it. In fact, I might know before this episode airs. We shall see. But for sure, that's next Wednesday when I'll be presenting my world's worst diabetes mom. And I'm also working on a virtual happy hour or something like that with Project Blue November for the world's worst diabetes mom. Thank you to people who are buying the book and talking about the book at this point. I really wish there was some way to kind of track it. I mean, I know that would be obnoxious, but you know, when I see somebody buying it on Amazon, I always want to reach out. Um, There's no way to do that, certainly, which is probably a good thing, but it would be fun to be able to do that. So if you've purchased the book, thank you so much. Let me know what you think about it, but I think it'd be fun to have a world's worst diabetes mom Zoom call and tell each other our world's worst stories right? Just for fun. So I'll be putting that up as well as soon as we get the date. And thanks to Project Blue November for helping me out with that. All right. Quick gut check around my house. Everybody's fine. We're struggling. We had a couple of weeks of classes. Then both of my kids had a spring break week that, I mean, what did they do for spring break? My daughter is baking every day. Benny is keeping very active. He's mowing the lawn. He's riding his bike. He's doing a bunch of (laughs) sit-ups. He's really trying to keep busy. And we're just doing the best that we can. So far, knock wood, everybody's healthy. So far, diabetes is behaving. You know, Benny really is doing a great job. Control IQ is chef's kiss. Mwah. Fantastic. I love it so much. Maybe we'll do an interview soon and talk a little bit more about it. But bottom line, you know, I don't share numbers. His A1C, according to Dexcom, because we couldn't go get a real A1C, is down more than half a point, And it was good to begin with. So very, very happy with Control IQ. I think that's it. The whole podcast schedule is just kablooey, but I don't think anybody knows what day of the week it is. So the goal is to get back on track with a Tuesday episode next week, but we'll see. Definitely follow along on social or, you know, subscribe on whatever podcast player you're listening to. This is actually a good time to bring that up if you're still listening. If you're listening on social media, that's great. Listen however is easy for you. 
But a very easy way to listen to podcasts is to get a podcast app on your phone. They're free. You can just use Apple Podcasts. If you're on Android, you can use Spotify or Pandora. We're on all these things, iHeartRadio. I'm on every single one of them. So whatever podcast player, wherever you get your audio, your music, you can listen to podcasts there. And if you subscribe, the next episode just pops up as soon as I hit publish. So that's the easiest way to never miss an episode. Well, thank you so much. Thank you to my editor, John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. I help everybody staying well, hanging in there, all the cliches that we're using right now. But sincerely, thank you so much for listening. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged. <laughs>